Well, uh, today's Remembrance Sunday, which for us is the Sunday on which we remember those who gave their lives. We're thankful for people giving their lives to defend our freedom. We're also thankful for the end of the war. That's why, if you've wondered why Remembrance Sunday is in November, that's why Remembrance Sunday is in November, because the war came to an end. We're celebrating the end of the war, not the Second World War, but the First World War, which came to an end on Armistice Day. Armistice is a, uh, an agreement to cease hostilities, and it was signed by the German army and by the um, Entente powers that were gathered to, to defeat Germany on the 11th of November in 1918. It marked the end of World War I. But if you know anything about history, you know it didn't fix the problem, did it? <laughs> this is, there's a problem with human nature. And no agreement on paper can fix the problem with human nature. As long as there are people who are willing to fight, willing to, willing to go to war in order to deprive other people of freedom or to deprive them of their goods or their land or um, their wives or whatever the, the reason is for the war, as long as there are evil people willing to use war for that purpose then and I, you've got to say, I, I'm thankful I'm, and, that there are people willing to stand up and say, no, we must fight. <laughs> and we're willing to give our lives to defend our land, our families, our freedom. I, I'm someone who believes, I'm not going to defend this today, but I believe that that's the kind of war that, Christians ought to be willing to fight and to, to give their lives in, in defending their families and their freedom and their land. But that's not what I want to talk to you about today. What I want to talk to you about today is the reality that there, there is a war, that, that there's a war that Christians must be totally unwilling to fight. And I'm talking about a war that's already raging, not with guns and bombs, but it's a war that's ongoing in, in our society. It's, it, I'm talking about class war. If you've seen the title on the screen, perhaps, you can see that I've given today's sermon the title, Ending Class War. We're in Titus chapter 3 and verse 2 today, and I haven't given it the title, Ending Class War, because I think we can end class war. I don't think we can. But because for you as Christians, class war has to be over. For you as a Christian, there needs to be an end to the hostilities of class war that can exist in your heart as a, as a believer, as a Christian that's, who's saved from within the classes of this world, there can remain hostilities that need to cease. And that's what I'm talking to you about today. So I'm hoping you're going to understand what I mean. Have a look again at verse 1 um, and 2 in, in Titus chapter 3. These are the verses I read to you earlier. Paul says, Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. Verse 2, to slander no one. To be peaceable, considerate, demonstrating all gentleness to all men. Um, now, do you own a, a Greek New Testament? Did you bring it with you? Can you read Greek? Okay, Tom's literal translation is what you're going to get if you didn't bring your own Greek New Testament you get Tom's literal translation. It's never been written, but here it is for Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Remind them, two rulers, two authorities, two, two Greek, two T-W-O Greek words, both in the dative case in Greek, 
which means to the rulers, to the authorities, with respect to the rulers, with, it, with, with respect to the authorities, remind them, and then here comes a whole load of things that we're supposed to be, a list of seven things that we should be towards rulers, towards authorities. If you were trying to diagram the grammar in the Greek language, it's really obvious what's going on here. Paul's giving um, them up front what all this that he's about to say is in relation to, and it's in relation to our relationship with the authorities, with government, with those who are above us, with those who are our rulers and our authorities, and you can't get away from that. And then he says, to be subject, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work and so on. And there's this list of things we're supposed to be. You could say then, as I did last week, fundamental attitudes, maybe, maybe fundamental stances, a, a stance that we're supposed to have in terms of our relationship towards the authorities, towards our rulers. And, and, and so... Can you see why I'm saying, now just to kind of give you a new title for this second sermon, seeing as I didn't finish it last time, um, can you see why I'm saying we need to cease hostilities, why, why we're talking about ending class war, because the authorities, the rulers, so, well that's, they're the people with the power, right? We could say as we get into this sermon, we're talking about the 1%, the billionaires, the power brokers, the government officials, the people who fly around in private jets making decisions that affect us, the corporations, the big tech leaders. There are people who are in authority and power structures above the 99%, above the rest of us, who, who live, you would say, on a different plane. But then there are actual literal authority structures and power structures from from literal kings, but also governments and magistrates, and, and, and they have their, their institutions of power, the police, the, the tax office, and, and so on, and so on, right down to the lowest level. And, and you say, these are the rulers, these are the authorities, and, um, well, I covered last time the first three of these seven fundamental attitudes, and so my job today is to cover the last four. We find them all in verse two. So if you're taking notes, um, we'll start with number four in verse two. And, and the first one for us today, number four in our list of seven, is that in respect to rulers, in respect to authorities and our relationship with them, you must slander no one. That's what it says here, verse 2. Now, um, means, if you want to turn this, by the way, this is the one exception in this list. It's not a to-be verb. Um, it's a straightforward verb, but I think the implication in the list is clear. If you want to make it into a to-be verb to make the list nice and neat, you could say we must be careful not to slander rulers and authorities, not to speak falsely about rulers and authorities. You must be slandering no one. Let's put it like that. Now, um, the Greek word for slander that's translated here as slander in the legacy standard Bible that I'm preaching from is blasphemeo. It's the Greek word that we get our English word to blaspheme from. And the dictionary definition, you like dictionary definitions, I hope, because they change your life. Um, the dictionary definition is to speak against someone in such a way as to harm or injure his reputation. Are you with me? Now, the English Standard Version translates it differently, to speak evil. So speak evil of no one. And, and, and I think they've got the idea in the word here, okay, but... Actually, that's the kind of translation that can lead to some very fine-sounding, nice sermons about the reality that we're all supposed to not say anything negative about anybody. I mean, oh, Johnny, you know, Johnny died at the funeral. He never had a bad word to say about anybody. Isn't that nice? And, and, 
and some of you might be expecting me to give that kind of sermon now. Some of you are probably saying, good, he's not going to do that, so we can slam them on Twitter. And I'm going to say, no, hold, hold your horses. There are other verses that deal with slamming people. Let no unwholesome thing come out of your mouth, but only that which is good for building up. Those kind of things need, your, need to govern your speech towards everyone. But this is talking specifically about people who are in authority over us, the rulers, the leaders, and it says we're not to blaspheme them. We're not to speak in such a way as to, as to harm their reputation, to injure or harm their reputation. Um, now that's helpful, isn't it? Because it, it, it really basically boils down to the fact that we should not say anything about anyone in authority which is false. False. Now, Jesus didn't sin, did he? But Jesus did say about Herod, go and tell that fox. And he called Herod a fox. And you say, well, he, that's not very positive, Jesus. So you couldn't say at Jesus' funeral, he never said anything, never said a bad word about anyone. Well, he called Herod a fox. What about Stephen, the martyr, Stephen? in Acts chapter 7, who went to his death saying to the leaders, the brothers and fathers who he'd started his sermon to, you men, stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, are always resisting the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Listen, you're no better than your fathers, he says to the leaders of his nation. And he said, but he's talking about authorities and he's talking about them negatively. Yes, but he's, he's telling them the truth about themselves, isn't he? And that's not wrong. It's not wrong to say something which is negative about somebody, but it would be very wrong to say something about someone that was not true, would it not? What would you call that? Slander. Okay, now, um, that would also include, now if I can just take that a, a little step further for our, uh, for our benefit, because you're going to, going to need to walk away from this uh, with, with something solid to go away. It would also include not saying anything that you didn't actually know was true about them. It, it, leaders, after all, they're, they, the rulers are people, aren't they? And, and it is re the reality that people are supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. So the fact that you hear something about something which sounds terrible doesn't mean that it's okay for you as a Christian to repeat that, even if it's about a leader. Are you with me? Somehow, as Christians, we can, we can get into the way of thinking where we, we look at people who are over us and we say they're wicked, they're, their morals are reprehensible, they actually are teaching and promoting things that we say are and God says, are abominations. These guys are corrupt. They're in power, but they're using their power to oppress people. And all of those things may be true, but that does not give you as a Christian a license to say one word about them that you do not know to be true. And just because you heard it, or just because you think it, just because you suspect it, doesn't make it true, does it? I mean, let me talk to some of you who are doctors. Let me talk to the doctors in the room for a moment and just say, what is it like when a patient starts to believe their own suspicions what, what, about themselves, about their health? You say that they're on the, they're on the road to madness. This is the, the leaving sanity behind. If you have suspicions in your mind and start to believe those suspicions just because you suspect them, you become convinced of them. This is the road to madness. In a, in a patient who's believing their suspicions about their own health, that's the road to unending, incurable anxiety. You have to be willing as a patient, but also as a person, to examine your own suspicions and say, in the light of fact, I don't necessarily believe what I even suspect may be true until it is proven true and to be willing to 
divorce yourself from your own suspicions. That's just being sane. And yet we live in a world where conspiracy theory thrives upon people being willing to simply believe their own suspicions, but then not only believe them, but teach as truth what is just basically a bunch of suspicions. And so we say as Christians, that's not okay. That's not okay. We're talking about our rulers. We're talking about our leaders. And why is it not okay? Well, it's not okay because God says you you mustn't slander them. And if you repeat something which is not actually true, it becomes a slanderous accusation, doesn't it? And you wouldn't want to even carelessly step into that as a Christian. So we're talking about our leaders, we're talking about our rulers, we're saying um, this is dangerous. Do, do, do you need to do some repenting here? Is, is, this, it, it, is there that tendency amongst Christians? I'm going to say, look, Yes, I read Twitter sometimes and get out as quickly as I can. I go on social media sometimes and have to repent. And just just looking at what people say about other people without proof, without confirmation, just because they've read it somewhere and it seems right, they'll retweet it and repost it. and, And Christian, beware, beware. God requires us to have a different fundamental attitude towards those who are in authority over us. And we'll look at why later. Um, But it should never be true of us as Christians that we're quick to blaspheme those in authority who are are our rulers. Okay, secondly. I'm just going to go through these really quickly. When I say secondly, we're on to number uh, five, six, and seven. There are three of them. I'm going to go through them really quickly. These are really easy. We're going to spend our time in apply, applying this at the end. Um, but these are really simple to understand. Secondly, we must be peaceable to rulers and authorities. This is verse 2, isn't it? The, the, to be peaceable. The word is amachus in Greek. It means not disposed to fight. Not quarrelsome, that's dictionary definition. There, there are plenty of people, aren't there, who are just disposed to fight. They are spoiling for a fight. They're like just itching. Ah, let me at them, if not with their fists, with their words. They just want to fight. And rulers and authorities live in that world. The world of politics is rightly called war without weapons. It is just... War continued by, by political means, and it is so scary. You can say people go into politics, that's what they sign up for. That's what they, that's what they you know, they, they've gone into that arena, they shouldn't expect anything less. Um, and, and, you know, for people to want to tear them down is just normal. I mean, you can't, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen, right? That's what people would say. There are always going to be worldly people who are spoiling for a fight with the rulers who are over them because worldly people operate in that worldly environment to tear down one leader, either by words or by weapons, and to step over their dead body, as it were, and step into their place and assume power. Right? That's how the, the world works. And if they can't do it with weapons, they do it with with other means, foul or fair, but the aim is tear them down and set up someone else, either the the person who's doing the tearing down or their favorite person, in their place. Uh, And the old adage is, all is fair in love and war. No, it's not. It's not fair, it's not right. It's not what God says God says it must not be true of you as a Christian. Why? Because you as a Christian fundamentally, as a basic stance towards people in authority over you, your rulers, your authorities, you must be peaceable, not looking for a fight. That has to describe you. It's it's an adjective. And when, when we say it's an adjective, 
there's a description. So if people looked at you, Christian, would they, would they rightly and naturally describe you in this way? It's a requirement. It's here with a to be verb attached to it. It's a requirement for you. You've got to be like this. Now, it doesn't mean you don't have principles. It doesn't mean you can't disagree. It doesn't mean you can't engage in legitimate political activity in order to seek to replace one leader with another. I'm not saying that. There are exceptions. There are qualifications, of course. I'm not, I'm not rewriting uh, our world and saying we just have to accept the status quo and never seek to do anything about it. That's not what I'm saying, but I am saying this has to be our fundamental attitude to those in authority over us. Peaceable. It would change things, wouldn't it? I mean, imagine Northern Ireland with this governing politics amongst people who profess to be Christians. If the overall description of true Christians was they're just peaceable, they don't want to fight. They're not interested in fighting. That would be radical. And I'm calling upon you today to be radical in obedience to God's word. Now, uh, thirdly in my list, so this is um, four, five, six. This is sixthly in our list of seven. We're getting there, aren't we? Um, we must be considerate to rulers and authorities. Epiakes is the Greek word, and the Legacy Standard Bible translates it as considerate. Um, the basic meaning involved in the word is gentle. It's a very lovely word in, in Greek. The dictionary definition is um, not insisting on every right of letter of law or custom. And then here are the, the suggestions for translation in the dictionary, uh, the, the Greek dictionary I read. Yielding, gentle, kind, courteous, tolerant. Now note that word yielding. The, the, the Legacy Standard Bible says consider it. In what way? Well, in, in the New American Standard Bible, it translates this in Philippians 4, 5. Let your, uh, ESV is let your reasonable be known to everyone. And ESV is let your um, gentleness of spirit, gentleness of spirit be known to everyone. The idea in this word gentle um, can refer to your overall attitude. And it can be one which is the opposite of being hard and uh, forceful and resistant. It can be one which is yielding and gentle. 1 Timothy 3.3, 3, description of an elder, not a violent, not, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and so on. Titus 3.2, that's our verse. James 3.17, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, and so on. 1 Peter 2.18, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle. It's all this word, epiakes. And the, the idea in considerate is, is, is the, very helpful for us because it's captured, I think, by the LSB as they've tried to understand what does it mean to be gentle towards those who are in authority, who are our rulers over us and they've got the idea I think caught up in that in that translation that we're to be people who are considering the difficulty of ruling of leading of being in authority this is very much the idea in Hebrews 13 17 isn't it if you know that verse Obey your leaders and submit to them, as for they are those who must give an account. That's what it says. Let me read it to you rather than um, mess it up. Hebrews 13, verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. 
so that they will do this with joy and not with groaning, for this would be unprofitable for you. What what causes leaders to groan? Well, it's when people are basically ungovernable. There's a responsibility in being a leader. There's a responsibility of being in authority that is connected with the, the, the job of overseeing, of, of exercising, you would say, leadership over a body of people. And if people are basically unyielding to that, if their response to that leadership, if their relationship with you as a leader is not one of gentleness, of, is not one of, of yieldingness to authority, then, then it just makes the job really hard. And you, if you could be a fly on the wall um, and see what life is like for us as pastors when um, we're trying to exercise oversight in a church and people are behaving in a, in a, in a, a way which is um, resistant, you would say, to leadership. You're just like, oh. This is hard. This is making it hard. It makes us groan. Now, it's not talking about us in the pastor in Titus 3, 1 and 2. It's talking about you and your relationship to your leaders in society, your rulers, your authorities. But now, get this, you're not supposed to make it hard for them either. (laughs) You're not supposed to be the kind of people who just can't be governed, who are not gentle, who are not yielding. Are you with me? It's not difficult to understand, is it? It's just we get these difficulties in our hearts. And it's especially so, is it not, when the leaders we have in society are corrupt, when they're immoral, when they're pursuing agendas that are just foul and you would say antithetical to Christianity. When they're promoting murder of unborn children. When they're parading immorality, which God calls an abomination. And they're celebrating it. And these are our leaders. These are our authorities. And you say, God really wants us to be gentle towards them? Well, yes, actually. Yes. And it is actually... God's requirement. You're not to be ungovernable. You're not to be the opposite of this. You're not to be the people who are just resistant to being governed. Now, I know that there are exceptions and rules and and things that we could discuss. I'm not saying that therefore we have to go along with their agenda. Please be clear about that. I'm saying we have to be willing to resist and speak against and suffer for disobedience to ungodly impositions upon us as Christians. We've got to be willing to disobey the government at that fundamental level, haven't we? Because we're, we're citizens of two kingdoms. We have a higher authority in our lives than the government. Yes, the government can say to us, you must submit and you must do X, Y, and Z. But we say, well, if if, if our God has told us to do A, B, and C and not to do X, Y, and Z, we've got to do A, B, C, and we can't do X, Y, and Z. Sorry. We, res- but we respect your authority. We do not resist your authority. We do not reject your authority. We respect your authority, but we respectfully have to decline to obey in these things. That does not mean we, we will become, however, and this is where we have to draw the fine line, that does not mean we will become ungovernable. And what's more, we must be known, we must be seen to be people who are gentle towards rulers and to authorities. Are you with me? These are fundamental stances. They're not difficult, they're just hard to do. Okay, last one, number seven. We must be demonstrating all gentleness to all men. You said, Tom, you just talked about being gentle. That was epiakes. Yes, well, this is prautes, prautetas, rather, in Greek. It's a different word. Also translated as gentleness sometimes, but 
the, the nuance here is interesting. It's translated as gentleness or meekness. Meekness. When those two words go together, epiakes and prautetas, um, well, the, the prautetas word means meekness. And I can show that to you in one verse. 2 Corinthians 10, 1. Both come together. I, Paul, myself, entreat you by the meekness, prautetas, and gentleness, epiakes, of Christ. So this is Paul appealing to the fact that Jesus was both meek and gentle. He was not the opposite of those things. Now, what's meekness? Meekness, to quote many preachers, and I don't know who to, who, who this, where this originated, but many a preacher has used this. Meekness is not weakness, but it's strength under control. Mark that down. Meekness is not weakness, it's strength under control. Jesus was meek and gentle, right? Meek and gentle. What's the meekness part of Jesus' meekness? It's not weakness. Jesus, Jesus was, was in the garden and, and, and the people gathered to arrest him. And he allowed himself to be arrested. He did it meekly. He went like a lamb to the slaughter, right? Didn't open his mouth in in protest. He He was silent before his accusers. We sing about that. But you know, when they said, when they said, where's Jesus of Nazareth? Jesus said, who are you seeking? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. And, And he said, ego eimi, I am. That's, that's the Greek version of the Old Testament name of God, right? I am that I am. Jesus just said, I am. And they, they're just overwhelmed by this sudden revelation of power. They, they draw back and fall to the ground. And then they have to get back up and go and um, arrest him. And, and he allows them to put their hands on him. And when Peter draws his sword, he says, put away your sword, Peter. Peter's ready to fight and to die. And Jesus says, no. Couldn't I, draw, couldn't I call on 12 legions of angels? Do you, do you not think I could do that? Do you not think I have the power to stop this? When, when they mocked him on the cross and said, if you're the son of God, if you're the Christ, come down from the cross that we may believe in you. Do you not think he could have done? Those nails were made of iron that he had created. It made the ore. The cross was made of wood that he had created. The, the molecules in, in the, the nerve cells supplying the heart muscle, those, um, those fibers supplying the heart muscle and keeping the hearts beating within every one of those soldiers guarding him, on the cross, he upheld by the word of his power. At any moment, the hearts of every one of those men could have just stopped beating at his say-so. He wouldn't even need to say so. He'd just need to stop keeping them alive. But the hand that thrust the spear into his side was enabled by his power to to exist. And this is mind-boggling, isn't it? But Jesus went to suffering with that meekness, not unable, but you would say unwilling to turn away from the suffering. Like a lamb, uncomplaining, unstruggling, unresisting, unfighting. Just made up a whole load of words, but... um, He chose to submit to that suffering. That's meekness, isn't it? Now, that's what's required of us. You say, is it really required of me? Yes, it is. Peter says in 1 Peter 2.21, for to this you have been called. What's he talking about in the previous verse? Enduring suffering 
while being treating, treated unjustly. For to this you have been called, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his footsteps. What? I have to follow in the footsteps of Jesus? Suffering at the hands of people who are morally corrupt? I mean, Pilate? Didn't even believe in truth. Pilate was a murderer. Pilate had abused his position of power. And, and yet you can, you can level all those charges against Pilate and you'd be right. But Jesus submitted himself to that. Jesus endured it, suffering unjustly. Those high priests who put Jesus on trial, were they right? No, they were wrong. They were wicked. Were they moral? No, they were hypocrites, Jesus said, and he exposed the hypocrisy. But you know, verse 23 says, who being reviled was not reviling in return. While suffering, he was uttering no threats, but kept, listen, kept entrusting himself to him who judges justly. What are you doing? What are you trusting in when you say, I am not going to fight back. I'm not going to be unyielding. I'm not going to be fundamentally someone who is spoiling for a fight or someone who is willing to blaspheme those above me to get them out of my way. What are you doing when you're, when you're following that path? You're, you're trusting God, aren't you, who judges justly. You're entrusting yourself. You're entrusting your soul. You're entrusting your future like Jesus did to him who judges justly. Now, I do realize that there are some pretty big objections to this. And, you know, we can talk about the objections, can't we? Um, first, I've got to just say it. Even though we talk about objections and you would say exceptions, you and I cannot use the objections we cannot use the exceptions to get out of these verses, can we? Nothing excuses us. Nothing here in the text excuses us from the responsibility to have these fundamental attitudes, these fundamental stances towards those who are in authority, towards those who are our rulers. And then you've got to say, well, what about the objections? Yeah, I think the biggest objection comes from people who just say, look, you're not being realistic, Tom. I mean, this is ridiculous. It, it, it is a dog-eat-dog world. We, we live in a world where these people are in power. They have real power over us. And, and that power over us is, is intrinsically wrong. And worse, these people are evil. Often they've obtained their power by corrupt means. They are in positions of, of influence which are just historical. They were just born into these powerful positions. They've inherited these, these great... Um, this great wealth that gives them the ability to just exercise power over us. And we are suffering as a result. And, and, and then there's a whole class of people like that. And, and we're the rest, we're the 99%, and we're just, we're just in the kind of oppressed class. And, and, and these people are in the class of being an oppressor. And, and, and our job is to... Our job is to resist. Our job is to rebel. Our job is to, is to tear them down. Well, I'm just going to say, guys, don't argue with me. Read the text. Tell me if anything I've said in the text is wrong. 
And tell me whether or not you believe our fundamental attitude towards these people has to be as it says in the text. I, I think the problems we have are, are pragmatic. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. If I, you know, these people, they're going to tread on me. If I don't growl at them, if I don't bark at them, they're just going to squash me. They're going to obliterate me. I'm going to suffer. So I have to fight back. I have to bark. I have to growl at them and tell them that if they come, on, they come near me, they're going to get a sore foot. Um, well, what are you committing to if you commit to this? You're committing like Jesus to the fact that God judges justly. God can defend you, can't he? Jesus said, do you not think I could call on 12 legions of angels? They put Peter in prison, didn't they? And, and they bound him in chains with a guard on either side. And when God decides to, God can send his angel and the chains just fall off and the doors just open. And you're out of prison, right? So you don't have to fight tooth and nail, scraping your feet along the floor saying, don't take me to prison. You don't have to scratch at the eyes of the police sent to arrest you. You can trust in God, can't you? Rather than saying, don't tread on me or else. You don't have to go to prison. You don't have to go to prison shouting Nazis at the, at the policemen who've been sent to do their job and take you away, do you? That's, that's not what we're seeing here. Um, what we're seeing here is a willingness to actually say, God, I trust you. I trust that you can take care of me. How, how do you have that? How do you have that willingness? Well, you've got to have the commitment to the fact that our kingdom is not in this world. That's what Jesus said. If it was, my servants would fight, right? But he didn't train us to fight. He told Peter to put away his sword. And he told his followers to be willing to suffer and to die. And, and not to be complaining and not to be fighting and not to be slandering and not to be... when when people persecute us, to pray for them, when people curse us, to bless them, to love our enemies, to do good to them. Someone takes your coat, if someone takes your, 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 your shirt, offer them your coat as well, right? I mean, this is, if someone says, you've got, to, you've got to carry this burden for one mile, that was a common thing, Roman soldier, carry it for two miles. You say, but this is an oppressor class. They're oppressing me. I need to be able to, I need to throw off oppression. That's salvation, isn't it? No, it's not salvation, actually. That's, that's a, a complete misunderstanding of what salvation is. Salvation is not deliverance from oppression in this life. Salvation is deliverance from the wrath of God in, in the life to come. And, so, and salvation is a, the, a promise to you of a kingdom to come, that you will be heirs of the kingdom. And salvation comes with this requirement that you be sons of your Father in heaven who said, when, when, when talking about Jesus now, the example that we have is, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Praying for people who were crucifying him. Now this is a fundamentally different attitude. So I, I'm trying to point this out because um, there is this thing called class war. Okay, it's a real thing. If you Google it, you'll go to the Wikipedia entry, you'll see in the Wikipedia entry a, a picture of a group of people outside number 10 Downing Street. Well, outside Downing Street, they're actually by the Cenotaph holding up a, a banner that they've created. They actually made a political party called Class War and uh, this was back in 2016. I think it got like 500 votes, um, thankfully. But the, the word class war is written dripping with blood. And underneath the picture are a whole load of crosses marking graves. And underneath the graves is the slogan, we've found new homes for the rich. I'm just going to put it to you again, that 
class war is a big deal. If you've been to university and you've studied one of the humanities, you've been taught philosophy which is derived from a fundamental viewpoint that we all need to be engaged in class struggle. That is part of the foundational teaching on almost every modern degree in the humanities. They're even teaching it in schools now. The idea that there are these oppressor classes who need to be and, 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 and that there's a struggle going on between the oppressed and the oppressor and that the job of the oppressed is to throw off the oppressor, that there's this class struggle and, and we're part of that and we're the 99% and it's those, it's those, it's those 1%, it's the, those billionaire cor- billionaires and the cor- corporate billionaires and the, the big tech companies and, and big government and big everything and it's them, they're the problem. And of course, I would say, what are you saying? You're saying that they're wicked? I agree. Are you saying that they're immoral? I agree. Are you saying that they're in power? Who can deny that? They have the power, don't they? Are you saying that the problem is that they're in charge? Now you and I have a disagreement. Because what you've just said is, okay, if we could just get rid of them and have a different group of people in charge, then we'd solve the problem. That's not what the Bible is telling you. For a Christian, class war has to end. It's not us and them anymore. There's there's only us. There's only sinners. You're a sinner. They're sinners. You need to be saved. They need to be saved. They're not the enemy. They're part of the mission field, right? You and I need to be, according to the Bible, you and I need to be praying for them. Not God strike them dead, but God bring them to life. Not God get them out of the way, but God bring them to the light. Bring them to repentance. Yes, they're wicked and immoral and perverse. And yes, they're pursuing their wicked, immoral, perverse agendas. Of course they are. But our job as Christians is to be representatives of the gospel. And according to Titus, Titus chapter 2, we're to adorn the gospel. Our lives have to say the gospel is true. This world is not our home. We're just a passing through. Our kingdom is in the world to come. So you can punish us now. You can abuse us now. You can oppress us now. It doesn't matter. We'll pray for you. We'll give way for you. We'll carry your burden an extra mile. You, you want to take our, our shirt? Here's, here's my coat. Take my coat. Why? Because this world is not our home. God is going to give us an inheritance that's forever. And you're going to miss it. You don't know, but you're lost. You think you have everything, but you have nothing. You think I have nothing, I have everything. My God has saved my soul, and I have heaven ahead. And there ain't nothing you can do to take that away. You can take away my goods. You can take away my honor. You can take away my kindred. You can take away my life. These things shall perish all. The city of God remaineth. That's what Luther said. You know, you you and I need to embody that. Maybe you and I need to do a bit of repenting because, you know, the problem for us is when someone begins to tread on us, the flesh rises up, doesn't it? And and in the past couple of years, we've had to say no to government. We say, no, no, we're not doing that. Sorry, you're overstepping the mark. God says, and we must. God tells us we've got to do it. You can make it illegal, we'll still do it. We'll suffer for it. But but we we can start getting riled up. The flesh can come up. 
we can begin to become people who are fundamentally rebellious. And that has to be dealt with. It's dealt with in these texts, isn't it? The, the other problem is some of us are schooled in rebellion. Some of us are just like born rebels. Ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. Others go to school and learn to be engaged in, in class struggle against the oppressor. And, and there are these people and they're the enemy. And then you come to the Bible and, and, and God says, love your enemies. Do good to these people. God says, obey. You say, obey? He says, submit. Submit. Be ready for every good work towards the, just be ready. You're like, you've got something good for me to do? I'll do it. I'm ready. I'm just itching to do good. Mr. Governor, Mr. Ruler, Mr. Authority, I'll do it. I'm good. I'm ready. But then, peaceable, gentle, all these qualities must describe us. So is that you? And that's my question. Do you have some repenting to do? Some of us do. Uh, I know I've had. Um, do you? Do, do we need to? Do we need to trust? Trust God over this. We do, don't we? Uh, we, we? We don't have to believe the government is good to believe government is good, do we? We don't have to believe that they're doing a they are great people to say that they deserve our prayers and our gentle, peaceable, submissive attitudes. And so um, I'm just calling upon you to to follow the Bible. Now, again, in closing, I know that there's all kinds of difficulties and you're going to go away from this and you're going to want to discuss all the exceptions. That's what you did last week I know because we talked to the fellowship group leaders and we say how did it go and they and then they, they, they told us they said you know what everyone really wanted to talk about all the exceptions <laughs> and what I said to you last week was now what we need to do is go away and say how do we obey this what does this look like in our lives what does this change in our lives let's learn to obey what God says here and Yes, we, we do have to talk about the exceptions. Can you, can you prepare those questions? Can you articulate them carefully, thoughtfully, prayerfully? Share them with your fellowship group leaders. Share them with us. We want to have time. I'm going to preach in a few weeks' time, hopefully, maybe the end of this year or the beginning of the next year. I want to preach about, okay, what do we do when the government, when we have to say no? How do we respectfully decline? What, how do we navigate the areas when, where the government oversteps the mark and what do we, how do we disobey in a way that pleases God? We need to navigate some complex waters. Someone talked to me after the first service and said, so you got me thinking, was, um, why is his name popped out of my head? Bonhoeffer, what was, was Bonhoeffer right to join in the assassination attempt on Hitler? If I asked you that question, they'd be like, yes, no, at the same time in the room, you know, from different people, from different perspectives. And, and those are very interesting questions to try to wrestle with. But that's for a different sermon, that's for a different day. I'm calling on you, Christian, to prayerfully look at how this text applies in our lives. Let's discuss that. Let's make sure we're obedient to this. We get this right. And then we can be safe if we're going to be um, taking a stand, as I believe we will have to in the days to come. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray that you would help us. Thank you for giving us clarity in your word. Thank you for just making it so simple. Lord, we realize that we complicate it with our many struggles of heart and mind and the struggles with our flesh lord please give us the ability to truly understand what you've said and to to begin to understand what that looks like in our lives to to work this out um, 
Lord, we, we pray for your blessing. We pray for anyone who today is just still unsaved. Lord, we ask you that you would save them, that you'd rescue them, that you'd help them to have this commitment to the reality that you, you've done what's necessary, that you've given us a kingdom beyond the grave, and that this world, with, with all its passing pleasures, is just passing, and we cannot escape your judgment and so Lord we pray that you bring them to repentance before it's too late that you bring them to trust in you and to know that they have an inheritance in the world to come we ask for Jesus sake